Okay, as I was saying, instead of live streaming today, what we're going to do is just record a kind of a private conversation. Since some of us can't make it, and since I'm not quite prepared to go over mill yet, we'll do mill tomorrow. I want to introduce you to Dr. Tartaglia, who is putting together two classes for this course for the website. Uh, both of them are really interesting. We talked, I mentioned once before that there's a course that's being put together on liberty and constitutional interpretation methods. That's one of the ones he's working on. And... Uh, uh, Dr. Tartaglia, uh, you mind if I let them know what the second one is? Because it's pretty cool. No, no, by all means, do, do okay. so. Okay, so uh, there's a topic that people bring up all the time. You'll see it in TED Talks. You'll see it on Twitter spaces. You'll see intellectuals, pseudo-intellectuals, actual intellectuals, all sorts of people referencing this thing and doing it inaccurately. I was one of them seven years ago, six years ago. Maybe it was only four years ago. I can't remember when we had this discussion. And uh, Dr. Tartaglia informed me that he spent a long time studying very carefully the actual issue. So he understands that it's being misused by all of us. And that issue is the topic of uh, the incompleteness theorem, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and what it proves and what it means and how it was proven and all of that. So he has a very, very careful study that shows exactly the mathematical steps and the proofs of the argument and what it actually means. And it's about a 10 lecture course series that he's putting together that will be released soon that we'll be doing through the website. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to him. Um, I've, I've mentioned him before as one of my friends uh, without maybe mentioning his name. But uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to have just sort of a free-for-all conversation about determinism and free will. And I think it'll be very interesting. One of the reasons it'll be interesting is that this is an issue that Dr. Tartaglia and I have been debating on opposite sides for about six or seven years, I would say, off and on. And um, you're going to find him extremely brilliant and really fun to listen to and, and just an excellent example of how to be a serious thinker. So it's my pleasure to introduce you all. Is your mic on, Twilight? Yes. Nice to meet you, uh, Dr. Tartaglia. What, what I, nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Would I be correct to uh, assume that, because, Zara, I'm not actually uh, up on what your opinion is on the debate, but if I were to <coughs> guess, I would, I would think you're either um, a compatibilist or you're, you're leaning into the determinist camp. Um, well, that's interesting. Wait, you, you said you're asking me, right? Yeah, that's for you. And I'm, I'm guessing uh, Dr. Tartaglia would be uh, on the um, free will side. Well, OK, so um, I'm glad that you don't know where I fall on this because I've been trying very hard to present the arguments of these people without giving away what I think. I'm certainly not on the determinist side. I would say I think Dr. Tartaglia would agree with me that he's closer to the he's not on the determinist side he's either. We have interesting and slightly nuanced views, but I think he's closer to the determinist side than I am. Is that correct? Would you say that's well, fair? Well, you um, by determinist, you mean hard determinist. I know um, you're not a hard determinist. I just mean closer than I am. Um I used to be a compatibilist, uh, but uh, from certain articles I've read, uh, uh, the, the, the authors, the authors brought, the authors seem to, seem to think that they were convinced by the argument, if everything is determined, if 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 the future can only be if the future is already there, if if, if uh, uh, how can I possibly be free? Um, for a long time, I thought that that question had been dismissed uh, uh, by most uh, that uh, that uh, thinking had been dismissed by most philosophers, but it's come back into the literature. And uh, <coughs> now uh, philosophers, some philosophers, 
think that that question makes sense and that the only answer is uh, um, in the final analysis, determinism uh, precludes our freedom. Oh, no. So uh, it, from our conversation yesterday and today, it does sound like you're even moving closer to determinism. Well, I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> I agree with them. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I I thought that uh, that uh, uh, some sort of uh, soft determinism uh, uh, was w was accepted by by uh, the majority of uh, what was the was the consensus among uh, uh, philosophers, but um, apparently it's not. Uh, um, my position is is sort of a cop-out in that I believe in the two world. Uh, I, 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 I can make sense of, of, of the problem only by adopting a two-language, two-world uh, 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 point of view. Well, that's disappointing. I think that that would probably accurately describe my position as well. We, we, we had so much debate yesterday talking about this. We're, I hope we're not too close to each other. I hope not. <laughs> I'm sure we're not. So, yeah, I, I think you're right about that. So to finally answer Twilight's question a little bit. Uh, so my view might not exactly be represented in, in the sections of what we're reading, but it's, it's describable by what Tartaglia said, which is interesting because we've been debating it for so long. But it's the idea that essentially... <clears throat> We have access to two different languages. The subjective and the objective is what Spinoza called them. Uh, Tartaglia doesn't like some of the connotations of that terminology sometimes. But uh, the idea is that either one sort of works on its own. Neither one translates well to the other. And yet neither one can therefore negate the other. And you kind of just have to live in a world where you accept you accept. This is definitely going to be different than what Tartaglia thinks. But what I would say is you have to accept the you have, you have to properly police where each language is most appropriate and accept the truths you can get from either one, even if they seem contradictory to the conclusions of the other one. So you have to just sort of live in the tension of the of the. So in other words, the hard determinist and the metaphysical libertarian are both correct, even though they're incompatible with each other. Um, so that might sound like an even worse cop out, but I'm happy to defend it and talk about it and sort of flush it out more if that helps. Uh, 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 say that again. I didn't quite. So I, I, I think my view is something close to the hard determinist is looking at the world from the east and the, the metaphysical libertarian is looking at the same world from the west and their perspectives cause them to accurately see things that are completely in opposition because they're looking from the opposite perceptual angle that's available to humanity, right? People can take on the language of the objective or the subjective. And when they honestly use that language to describe the cosmos, they're on opposite ends of the mountain. And so they're in opposition. They're incompatible. They're, they look like they're fighting against each other. But the truth is that sort of the tension of both of them leads to kind of that mountaintop place where you just sort of have to live with the fact that there's two opposing sides to make the mountain and, and, um, but, uh, uh, but both, uh, and, uh, both speak both languages. Uh, no. the objectivists talk about the subjective, but I don't think they, their languages are incompatible, I think. So if, if you want to model the world as made up of made up of objects that you can measure, you're sort of taking a perspective of, of a Christian God outside the universe. The universe is on his workbench. It's like a clock and he's measuring the angles and the momentums and the speeds of the different gears and everything. But he's taking the perspective of looking at the beam of light and measuring its length. Whereas if you're in the universe as a part of the cosmos, 
that beam of light can hit you in the eye and you're still seeing the same light, but it's a completely different visual perceptual experience. And that the, the way you would describe what, what the beam of light is like or what being is like from either of those perspectives, it, they just don't translate into each other. Um, the beam of light hitting you, you would talk about like uh, warmth and brightness, whereas the other perspective, you would talk about length, breadth and width and location and things like that. But the, the same person can do that. Uh, the, the, yeah. the scientist... The scientist uh, comes out of his comes out of his uh, lab where he was thinking completely deterministically, and he goes uh, 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 driving home. He feels the sun on his face. He 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 thinks to himself how 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 wonderful the world is. He goes home. He disciplines his kids. Uh, 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 assuming that they're responsible for what they're doing. Uh, uh, so this is all the same person. Yes. Uh, switching, switching worlds. Absolutely. That's all I'm saying is that we can keep two sets of books and we do. Right. So a really good scientist is thinking completely objectively in the lab. There's few of them, but they are. And, and they're doing exactly that. And as you rightly point out, when they're driving home and they're thinking about their evening meal with their spouse and this fucking traffic and all of that, they're not thinking in, in, in that way at all because we have access to two completely different perspectives. I don't think a single individual is an embodiment of just one. We have access to both of them, but okay. both of them are incompatible. If, if he tried to think like an objective causa, causationalist scientist when dealing with his child, he would be a retarded parent in a sense. He would, he would be very bad at helping to encourage his son to take responsibility for things, which is what his son needs to be told in order to, to grow into a full human. And so he has to adopt both of these languages. It's like two different rails that the train rides on. They're parallel. They never cross. They never touch but you kind of have to rest on both of them in order to, to navigate being or something like that. But uh, uh, an interesting question is, is uh, how, does he, how does he gain knowledge in each of these worlds? Yeah. We know, <laughs> we know how, how, how he gains knowledge in the scientific world. Uh, that's quite clear. In the in in this other world, it seems to me that he also uses the scientific method to some extent. He, so the I, the reason why you say that is that you I, you have this definition of the scientific method, which you might be correct, but it's not the one I would use, which is something like. Right reason applied to empirical questions or to questions about the world or something like that. Like your definition of science is broader than mine. Right. I, I would say that he's not. I would say the rules of right reason are larger than the rules of right reason restricted to empirical consequence questions and considerations only. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it science, but I mean, that might just be semantic and we can. So. So let's say that's semantic and let's say I just answer your question and say, okay, he's using the, the same thinking principles as a scientist and he's using the same thinking principles as he's trying to model characters and navigate a world of personalities right. and things. Right. So I agree with that. Um, and so the, the, your question is how we, you say we know how he finds truth in the first one. How can you find truth in the second one? Well, let's first look at the first one. He finds truth by utilizing his method correctly and limiting what he's allowed to consider. And all of that is underpinned by a great deal of things that are inherently characterological as well. So he wants to be a good, he wants to do a good experiment. Why? Because he wants to be a good employee or he wants to be even better, a good scientist. Why? because he wants to be a good member of the community, right? So you don't have to go too far away from the very specific thing he's doing to start saying, wait a minute, 
There's a lot of personality and characterological elements that go into making it possible to have a lab that's sterile with a guy working in it, applying a method that's open to criticism by his peers and all of that. That what when he's doing that one thing, yes, he's thinking objectively, but that one thing is is resting upon a bunch of pillars of sociological, familial, cultural, maybe his relationship to the divine, whatever it is, it's all characterological and relational, how he sees himself and what he wants to be and aspires to be and how he acts out in integrally that, that role in, in the community. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is to say, okay, well, those underpinnings better be pretty secure. I mean, we don't just have scientific laboratories and, and experiments developing out of nothing. They're clearly underpinned by a great deal of support. So there better be some way of getting to some kind of truth about that support. And I think we talked about it yesterday. And the idea is something like <clears throat> the language that's appropriate to discuss character characters is narrative. It, it's like you can't get to a more basic language than that one because you you, you can't describe <clears throat> you can't describe uh, Kent saying to King Lear, you know, let Kent be unruly when Lear is mad. You can't describe that based in physics and chemistry and neuroscience. It, it's a character, and that's really sort of as low as you can go, I think. So in any case, character characterological discussions have to be in narrative, and narrative is. Here's a guy, here's what he's like, here's how he, the way you know what he's like is how he interacts with this other character, Ophelia or Horatio or, or Hamlet's uncle or whatever. So you find out what the character's like by how he relates to other characters. And now he has to go from point A to point B and here's what happens along the way. That's the basic narrative structure. So we've spent about 250,000 years trying to get the stories right in order to tell us how we should, what kind of characters we should be in the world. And we, and because we did that, we've had 500 years of Cartesian science that's been able to emerge in what we're doing. So the direct answer is what I said to you yesterday. If, if a story told you to if, if you read a story about how to be in the world and your conclusion, or let's say your response to the story after you put it down was life's not worth living and nobody matters and I may as well kill myself. And if you read another story and it says, and you, you walk away with the reaction of life's really hard, but I can make it. I can make it better if I strive and work really hard and aim at the light. Which of those stories is more true? And if your answer to the question is that the second story is more true, then you're, you're agreeing that there's some kind of truth that can be found in that narrative language. Well, I, uh, I concede the importance of, of narrative in, in our in developing our personalities and character. But it, it, it seems to me that it's uh, somewhat derivative. Uh, 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 I learned uh, growing up as a child, I, I, I size up other people. Uh, uh, some people uh, tend to keep their promises, some don't. Uh, uh, I, 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 I figure out that uh, the bullies don't, don't, uh, don't get very far because no one wants to play with them mm -hmm. and and they're left out and they suffer because of that i learn all sorts of things by the same method that science uses the method of hypothesis i i i come up with hypotheses about about the best way to go about something and i test them and uh, and uh, uh i i gain knowledge that way uh that's for sure okay. What the narrative is, the, the narrative is an extension and a powerful extension uh, 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 to my uh, uh, everyday experience. I can't, ex I can't experience being in Africa and dealing with uh, 
ferocious animals, but I can read about them and and do the same kind of thinking that I do uh, with uh, with uh, with live with people in my environment. Uh, uh, but I I I do not see I do not epistemologically I do not see another source, another method of, of, of gaining knowledge here. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, you might be right. Let me ask a couple quick questions. So you're saying you're hypothesizing about how you should act, and you're also getting data for your models and for your experiment by watching how other people act, right? right. So if you think to yourself, oh, maybe I want to be a bully, and then you say, well, it's not working out too well for him. You're, you're collecting data. You're putting that in scientific terms. I'm collecting data about whether, like, it's experiments being run around you. The other people are, are performing experiments. You're collecting data. And then you're, you're basically, you're saying you're thinking in exactly the same way that a scientist thinks. Yeah. It's just about character. The first question is, do you think most people are doing that? Well, we uh, yeah, yes, because because uh, we we we're not even aware that we're that we're doing that. We're not even aware that we're uh, uh, coming up with hypotheses and testing them. Uh, uh, it just it's sort of second nature to us. Uh, 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 that's what intelligence is all about. Uh, that's what intelligence is all about. Do you think? the majority of people are intelligent. Yeah, intelligent enough. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. If you get hit in the head with a two by four, uh, uh, you want to, avo everyone wants to avoid that in the future. Right. So I, I, yeah, I tend to think that 30 to 80% of people probably aren't like that, that what they do is, the pain and the pleasure are basically just triggers that get them to behave differently. But I don't think there's any thinking process where they're saying, I wonder what would happen if I acted this way or that way. I, I do believe it's true that you do that and that you've done that your whole life. I just don't know. I mean, when I look at people, I see them making the same mistake and getting hit by the same two by four over and over and over again. And the two by four is there to keep them from continuing that day but um, they go back to it. But maybe I'm wrong about that. It doesn't even really matter. I see how broadly you're defining scientific thinking and you're saying that's just what people are doing when they're deciding how to act and, and looking at other people and thinking about them as examples. So that sounds, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. But still there's, there's a switch Interestingly enough, I see the method the same, but the, the, there's a switch in the in in the language, we, we, which is we, necessary, I think. We we stop talking about uh, molecules and and nerve cells, and we start talking about intentions and the desires uh, and responsibility and uh, yes, and character, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think I have anything to quarrel with you on in, in your just so what's weird about these two different languages is that all the words are analogous to each other, right? We just use the word running an experiment, but really we meant observing the way people are behaving and how well it works for them, which is very far away from what we would mean when we said an experiment in a lab, right? So so the ideas of truth, they go from propositions that map onto reality, which is in the philosophical propositional world. And also, it, well, that's, that's what it means in the philosophical world. I think in the scientific world, it's more limited. It's something like a formula that accurately fits the data. So give a bunch of data and it can predict the next piece of data. So it's really just a formulaic descriptor of data that we find simplistic and useful. So the, the formula for an ellipsis describes the path that the star will take or something like that. So go and collect data, put it in, put a new time in, you can tell where the star will be, that kind of thing. But in 
characterological terminology, we still use the word truth, but it it's clearly got a slightly different meaning. I, I, I think it's maybe more than analogous, but it's just because we're in this other realm, it's something like, I will be true, my darling. The, the, the character that, I, that you think I have, that I present to have, that I act as though I have, it will be consistent when you're not watching. I will be true, my darling. Or uh, he, he hit his mark, or the arrow flew straight and true, something like that. It's always in the language of going from point A to point B. And so, so that's one example. We saw experiment, belief, knowledge, right? You, you, you don't know a person the way you know a proposition. The way you know something in philosophy is you accept a proposition that you have reason to believe maps onto the world accurately. If you've got good reason to believe it, and it does, you might call that knowledge perhaps. But in this other personal realm, knowledge is, I know my wife. Well, what do you mean? Well, I know she wouldn't do what you told me she did, or I know, she, I know she'll laugh at this joke. But it doesn't mean I've... It, it doesn't mean she can be simplified into something that I have no more questions about or couldn't get to know better tomorrow, something like that. Um, well, science, uh, science permits that, too. Uh, yeah. You want to be careful there. Uh, no, you're, right. you're right. That's why I paused before I said it, because I realized in the in the scientific and in the propositional realms, both there's always room for further refinement. So that's true mm -hmm. in all, all three realms. We never finish our inquiry and rest on an answer and, and, and don't have any cause to. One, 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 of, one, of the, uh, one of the things that keeps our positions apart is I can, I, 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 believe, I, I believe all knowledge and all truth must be propositional. Yeah, you do. And you you don't, obviously. Well, I, I think I agree with you that the definition of knowledge and truth that starts with proposition in the definition um, is qualitatively different than the way I want to use the words truth and knowledge in this other realm. Right. So I respect the distinction that you're drawing there. Um, but I still want to use the terms knowledge and truth in the realm in this other realm. And but but what's dangerous? That's dangerous. Perhaps you you can you can uh, keep clear in your mind that uh, that uh, uh, you're using uh, a different sense of of truth. But uh, what um, what many writers do, they forget about that after a while and yeah. start claiming that that. Uh, uh, something is true for you. Something is true for me. And who's to say what's true? And not, uh, uh, it's very dangerous to do it. You're one hundred percent correct that it, it is dangerous in exactly that way. And they either fall into that relativism or they fall into an absolutism, where they say, "I know I've got the truth, and it's propos like I've extracted the propositional truth because I'm trying to put words around the thing that I think I know from the story." And because I got it from the story, I don't need to take this new proposition to the ethicists or the philosophers to debate it out and see if it wins and passes logical tests. And you're absolutely right. It's extremely dangerous because you have to remember the distinction and what kind of truth you're talking about in each of the realms. I, I, I feel comfortable doing it, especially since in the scientific realm, I want to limit the idea of truth and knowledge to something like probabilistic descriptions. And I think that scientists fail to do that as well. They fail to recognize the difference, the distinction between the kind of truth that they're finding. And they think, well, um, I know how to, I, I, heard, I heard somebody say this the other day, I know how to land a spaceship on Mars. Therefore, I know enough about gravity. I know gravity. I understand gravity. Gravity is something I have the knowledge of. It's like, no, not to a philosopher, you don't, right? Like all you've ever done is come up with probabilistic descriptions of things. You've come up with stories that in their terminology, they don't even pretend to be offering explanations. They're nothing but descriptors, which is fine. They're extremely valuable and you'll never get to Mars. Without yeah, but, you know, you know, the typical scientist would, 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 would say, 
I'm not interested in the I'm not interested in the metaphysical essence of gravity. Sure. Uh, it's it's it, I, I'm I'm interested in in being able to predict on the basis of my uh, scientific theory, which incorporates uh, the notion of gravity. Uh, he, sh he should say that. He should say that, and we should be dissatisfied that he's given us an explanation. But he's supposed to think in that way. So more power to him. But the problem is he's making the same error that you were talking about the other side making, where he's failing to remember the distinction between the quality of his knowledge Right. Like he should be satisfied with that. That's his job. That's what he's up to. Now, in my view, the greatest scientists go further than that. And they act like philosophers and they invent whole fields. of Yeah, science. that's true. They, the, they, they were philosophers. Uh, they were. They, that's how they came. You know, Darwin was doing philosophy. And now we have a billion trillion biological questions we can answer according to the formulas that are the, the framework and the clarification of the notions that he came up with. But the, the regular scientists, who, uh, it was Neil deGrasse Tyson who said, I can land on Mars. Don't tell me I don't understand gravity. And I'm thinking, you don't understand anything about gravity except how it works, which is super powerful and what you need to know to get to Mars. Yeah, so, but, 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 but uh, Peirce said there's nothing else to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, know. And many philosophers, many scientists, many philosophers still say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, well, you and I have talked about this for a long time, but there's this, there's this fad or tendency or trend of many philosophy departments today to say the purpose of the philosophy department is to make a really nice sign that points to the STEM departments. And once you show that that's the right way to think, there's, <laughs> why talk about ethics? Why talk about metaphysics? Why talk about the greatest conversations that have been recorded that our species has been pursuing? Because after all, look what science can do. And I think it's sad that they do that. And I think they're wrong to do that. I love science. I don't want to throw it out. I don't want to believe anything with empirical consequences that goes against their experiments. And at the same time, I'm not, I'm not impressed. I have no penis envy for the scientists. And I would very much rather ha talk about the metaphysics and, and those other things. Let me ask, is, is our third member still uh, with us? So we have four in right now. I don't know if you can see the screen. We have a couple uh, that are not going to be here today. So we're going to do this chat instead of our regular. Our, uh, uh, can we hear from, uh, from them? Yeah, we've been blustering a lot. Why don't we shut up? Uh, Path, Twilight, yeah. your thoughts. I'm just trying to uh, wrap my head around which angle to approach it from. Um, I'm sort of like an, I'm, I think I'm probably like an ant in an ocean of, uh, you know, the concept you guys are talking about. So I don't know how fruitful my contributions would be. But, they um, be more fruitful than you think. And welcome to the conversation. This is what we're here to learn how to do and to get better at. So please feel free and thank you for participating. Well, uh, hmm. I mean, I might be starting anew here be, um, in my own sort of direction of free will versus determinism. I, I guess I have my own, uh, maybe my own preliminary conclusion on how I frame the debate. And it, uh, I don't know how, um, well, whatever. But I, I guess the way that I look at it is, it, and it might be similar to William James, but it's maybe not a, a whole lot. But I guess it's that maybe similar to the way you said in, in that um, they can both be true. But maybe it's that I, I um, short circuit the problem in that. And, and I've always like it, it was. I, I hate to make it seem like I'm piggybacking William James, but I've thought this for some time and I'm not that I'm surely not the first, obviously, but it's just that I've, I've, I've always thought that um, it seems like what somebody should be concerned with once they familiar, familiarize themselves with the debate is, okay, how can I increase my free will? Like, it, whether it exists or not, um, it exists maybe 
as a belief or something and that can only like better your life and so um what steps can i take to increase my free will even if it doesn't exist and so i i, I guess would i be falling in the category of pragmatist here Oh, that's very interesting. So there's been a number of thinkers who have hinted at the idea that part of the problem with the debate is the idea of a one in zero binary way of looking at it. And really, they talk about degrees of freedom and that maybe, you know, a lot of the libertarians we've read have basically said, yeah, most people most of the time are not free. But occasionally with the right setup, you can develop the ability to push against the things that would pull you like a puppet or whatever argument they're specifically making. And they say that there are different degrees of freedom. And so implicit in that, I think, <clears throat> especially with the ones we've looked at, I think implicit in that is the idea that you're talking about, which is let's aim towards greater freedom. You know, sometimes I'm not terribly in control of things, obviously, but what if I was moving in that direction as an aim? That's a very interesting reframe of the whole question. Obviously, the hard determinists would say, well, what are you talking about? You've got no hope. Everything you do, including, as Paul Ray pointed out, your free will or I mean your willpower, that's all just as caused and determined as anything else. But for all for many of the compatibilists and the libertarians, they, they don't have this everything's free and everything you choose to do from your own austere, separate from the world perspective. And you're acting like a prime moving God all the time. They, they all tend to say, well, no, the determinists are basically correct most of the time. However, human beings have the ability to push back against their programming, and they think that means that they have some freedom and that they might increase that level of freedom, whereas the hard determinists would say, no, that is also caused. So that's interesting. The second thing I wanted to say is I am also really impressed with William James. Um, so maybe we should, maybe you should talk more about what you liked about his perspective there. Um, but we'll circle back to that. Oh, go ahead. I well, I honestly, I actually plan on going back to William James because I think sort of as Path had, was uh, alluding to, I, I think that um, it, it's sort of like a, a Christmas present that you really have to um, um, delicately unwrap the, the paper if you and like if your motive is to keep the wrapping paper because it, it's like uh, I'm, I, I don't that's my family's weird they, they like to keep the wrapping paper so I just see like people like William James um, uh, and uh, John Stuart Mill or uh, to, to a village idiot like me they're, they're pretty wordy um, and so you really have to uh, delicately understand and sort of meditate on what they're saying, but it does sound <laughs> like um, what William James is saying is pretty much similar to what, so what let's I talk believe. Yeah, Unless yeah. I have so, it wrong. No, I think uh, I think he's. I think. He, Can I piggyback that real quick? Yeah, I want to piggyback what Ben and I just said for just for just a quick sec. Uh, I want to read him again as well, and I want to keep it because I'd never read anything from him before. But 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 I do. Uh, I, I did like his arguments. Some some of it was real wordy, and sometimes they get distracted. So some of that's on me. But uh, but I want to read it again, keeping in mind uh, that he wrote a really influential psychology book, and trying to understand him and how. The whole psych psychology aspect might m might affect his perspective because uh, determinism very much. I, I mean, what good is psychology in the first place if everything is predetermined? In a way, somebody could argue that. I'm not saying that I would, but uh, anyhow, I'm shutting up. No, that's right. We're going to read another excerpt from some psychologists who are going to be talking about determinism and free will later on, too. And I think you're right. It's, it's really applicable. So if you remember on the website, if you've got a screen that goes far enough to the right and left until I fix it, the William James section has 10 suggested extra readings if you happen to be into him. And I just posted a link to one of them, which is his writing called The Meaning of Truth. 
So it's in the private chat there if you click on it. I'm actually reading right now. I'm, I'm just starting his psychology book that Path was mentioning. So uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of interest in William James. Um, so what might be fun is to talk about his ideas again and just remind us of what his arguments exactly were really quickly. And uh, I think I think Tartaglia might have a lot of good criticism of it and, and some interesting insights. So remember, the first thing he feels he has to prove is the following, which is, so he'll, well, before he proves it, he sets up the argument this way. He says, the real difference between the libertarians and the determinists, and he, he wipes away all the compatibilists. He says, every middle ground person is full of nonsense. They're not taking the problem seriously enough. Just like Dr. Tartaglia pointed out, there's, there's some new writings that are pointing in that direction. Like, no, this is, this is really a problem. So he wipes them out and says, we're not even going to talk about that. He says, okay, the determinists and the libertarians, here's what they're dis here's what they're here's one aspect of their disagreement we can boil it down to, and it's this. The determinists don't believe in real possibilities. They think things look like possibilities until one thing happens. And when that thing happens, if we knew all of the factors that went into making that thing happen, we would recognize that that thing was not a possibility, it was a necessity. And all of the other things we thought were possible that could have happened instead, those were actually impossibilities. Now, we don't have access to all the knowledge that would prove that to us, the determinists might say, but their position is that if we did know all of the factors that go into everything, we would be able to predict it perfectly because it can only lead one way. And then he says, of course, the libertarians, the distinction is that they actually believe in real possibilities. They think often the physical world and lots of aspects of being might be deterministic, but there are at least points in time where there's an actual free choice that an agent makes. And basically the way he words it is the universe waits for that moment before it decides where to go in the future. And so it's basically, it can't, it can't figure out where the universe is going until the agent shows up and makes a decision and then it can continue to play itself out. So he boils down the question to the distinction is are, are possibilities illusory or are they real? And then he says this, he says, I, I don't know what the answer is and I can't prove what the answer is, which is good because I'd like to believe that we're free. And if I could prove it, you'd be forced to believe me. So instead, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to prove that science and the scientific way of thinking, I believe in the way Dr. Tartaglia means in the broad sense of scientific thinking, has no ability to resolve this question for us. So he's first going to argue that science can't tell us the answer to this question. And once he's proven that, he's now left with two options. I could choose to believe in determinism or I could choose to believe in libertarianism. I could believe in freedom. And he doesn't say, I just pick whichever one I want. He says, that's our starting point. Now let's apply philosophy to that. And he looks at the consequences of the ideas and well, we'll talk about where he goes after that. First, let's let's talk about his argument that science can't tell us if seeming possibilities are actual possibilities or real possibilities or if they're just illusory and impossible. And his argument goes something like this. Science is about what's real in the world, what's actually happened. It starts with data collection or it, it always has an element of data collection in it. It's about the real world as we observe it. Hold on a second. Hey, doggy, come here. Come here. Hey, Norm. Norm. Good morning. Okay. <clears throat> so he says science is about looking at the real world. And the problem is that type of language could never look at things that didn't happen. The question is, are the things that didn't happen, which seemed possible, are they real, like real possibilities, or are they illusory? Well, we can never have access to their nature because they never happened. And since they never happened, we can never do anything to examine whether or not they're real as possibilities or just illusory and impossible. That's the gist of his argument. So once he makes that argument, he then goes further. Why don't we pause there and see what do we think about his first two moves, his definition of the problem and his argument that we can never resolve it.
Is that for us or uh, Dr. Tartaglia? Yeah, we're, we're all on track so far. Is there anything to quarrel with Dr. Tartaglia? Well, the, um, <clears throat> you put it in terms of possibilities. Uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> science seems science seems to accept uh, what's called uh, causal, the causal closure of the universe. And that, and a word is uh, every physical, every physical event has a physical cause, period. Yes. So um, uh, the scientist is not in a position to even, even contemplate these, uh, these, uh, these possibilities uh, in 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 the in the evolution of of the world. Uh, I think that's I think that's an even stronger argument than the one William James made, and I think it's correct. So, uh, the scientist, well, except for except for the broadening. concept of the physical which is getting broader and broader in science uh, uh, yeah the, the my position is quite simple as as uh, yeah one thing I don't like about the de the uh, determinist the the, the determinist uh, who who denies freedom, the hard determinist, is that um, uh, if you ask him to, <laughs> if you ask him to, uh, uh, if you ask him what what could happen, what can he describe a, a situation? in which he would give up his uh, determinism. Yeah. Uh, he, he's not in a position to do that. You, you, you when, when, the, uh, when the libertarian comes up with an example that's, that we all agree uh, uh, is an example of, of, of freedom, uh, 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 a, a chained a chained person uh, uh, is uh, is released from his chain and then he gets up and walks across uh, the the <laughs> the room uh, uh, everyone would agree that he he's free in walking now and he wasn't free before uh, but the the uh, the uh, the liber the uh, uh, determinist, the hard determinist, would say, "No, uh, even 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 that was predictable. His walking across the uh, 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 the, the floor and and uh, e eons ago, and and so he's not free. He could not have acted otherwise. Uh, uh, what?" My criticism is, I, I, I'm suspect. I'm suspect of, of theories which which one. Uh, he's not willing. The, the, the determinist is not willing to tell us what would counter his. He's what would make his his theory false? Other than that's right. Other than uh, an event, other than a break in the causal chain, and an event taking place uncaused. Well, th but that's absurd to him. That can't yeah. happen. If if yeah. that did happen right in front of him, he would say, "Well, I told you all along." The chains that made him walk along the room were invisible because we don't have access to them. So. He, it's a it's a faith position that there are invisible chains forcing everything to happen. 
And I think you're exactly right. So, so let's talk about this idea of yours really quickly here, because <clears throat> it seems like a strength of a position that you couldn't imagine arguing against it. And the problem with the determinists is they, they, they're so sure they must be right that they fail to realize that they've defined it in a way that's become tautological. It, so when Dr. Tartaglia says that they can't give you the conditions under which they would admit they were wrong, what that means is even if we're not living in this world, there's no hypothetical world, okay? So when we're trying to decide what's true about the world, we're distinguishing this world from other worlds that we're not in. What, what the problem with the determinist position might be, uh, or at least a sign of the weakness is, their idea would not distinguish this world from any possible world that you could possibly describe. Because when you, when you say something happens without a cause, they can't imagine it. They just say, no, that's not how things work. I, I have a faith position that nothing works that way. So there's nothing you could ever present them with that would make them say, well, you know, I already knew I didn't know all the causes, but I'm sure the causes must be there for X to happen if X happened. Now, that seems like a strong position, but the weakness of it is, is, is in the following. If the, if, the, if the model you're using to understand the world does not draw a distinction between the world you're living in and any world you might be living in, it's actually tautological. It's meaningless. It, does, it serves no purpose to inform you about the world you're living in, right? For obvious reasons, because you could be in any world and it would still be true. So it's actually, that's a really cool criticism that we haven't discussed and I'm not sure ever occurred to me before. But William James gets there in his paper because he points out that this is a faith position for both sides. So he says the libertarians and the determinists both express something about their character that wants to believe either that the world is is ultimately rational, even if I don't know all the factors, or that ultimately I have the freedom to make things different than they are. And that your choice to believe either one says more about what you want to think is true than it says about the world itself. So that's actually where William James is going. But let's pause for a moment and just look at that criticism. So Tartaglia's criticism is if if your idea is so true that it couldn't possibly, you can't even tell me what would happen that would make you think it's not true. It's actually meaningless. Okay, It doesn't bear on the world you're living in. It doesn't tell you anything about the world you're living in. It's just you spouting your faith position every time. We haven't gotten anywhere near this deep in the course yet. That was a really cool criticism. What do you guys think about that idea? Uh, first of all, did I word that correctly? I think so. Okay. Well, maybe it's not as coherent as it could have been. But uh, Path and Twilight, what do you think about this idea that if if you can't possibly offer up even a hypothetical that would make you say, oh, look, I'm wrong. This has happened. Right? Even if you don't expect that thing to ever happen, if you can't put into words what could be presented to you as evidence that you're wrong, your idea actually isn't about the world at all. I think that's it's very interesting and very apt. I mean, I, th I think it also coincides with um, the characters on the, well, as far as I'm aware, the characters in the uh, materialism versus dualism, idealism debate. It seems like there's a lot of overlap between uh, the materialists and the determinists, and it seems like they... Um, share this uh, um sort of uh scene like uh the state they set the stage in such a way to let's like they build a moat around the, their position and make it impossible to uh it's just a, it, impenetrable but um they like you say it's almost like they in so doing divorce themselves from reality or, or something path what do you think He may be AFK. Um, yeah, I think I, I've been nodding while you were talking, Twilight. I, I tend to. I, all right. So so let's go into the rest of his argument. So his argument so far is you can't settle this question. And the question could be boiled down to 
are poss are seemingly possible alternatives actual or are they real possibilities or are they in the final analysis would they be found to be impossibilities and he says you can't settle that question scientifically uh dr tartaglia added another interesting way in which it can't be settled and i think it's even stronger than his but in any case then he says okay so what are we to do with this question because the question sure seems like it means something I'm interested in this question. This is a question that I don't think we should say doesn't bother us. Of course, of course it matters. So he doesn't just say, well, it can't be resolved and it's meaningless. It's a faith position. Let's go talk about something else. He says, no, this is, let me get my philosopher's medical bag out. This is what philosophers are for. Let's start making progress. And what he says is, okay, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the consequences of believing either of these things. He doesn't mean the sociological consequences exactly, or at least not directly. He says, what are the philosophical consequences of believing either of these perspectives of the world? And he says, I'm gonna flush out as best I can briefly what some of the other things I would have to believe if I believed the world was deterministic or what some of the other things I'd have to believe if I believed that there was an element of agency and choice that could break a, 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 an otherwise unbreakable chain of, of deterministic causality. Let's look at the consequences. And then he says, I'm not going to discover which is true because I don't think I can. So I'm not going to look at the consequences to say, oh, look, here's a contradiction in the idea. So therefore we can throw away libertarianism or we can throw away determinism. He says, no, 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 we're not going to be able to settle it. But that's OK with me because I think we have freedom. And if we could settle it, you wouldn't be free to believe in determinism anymore. It's kind of a, a little joke of his, but I think he means it. In any case, he says, we're going to look at the consequences so that we can be clearer about why we're interested in believing one or the other. And we might even persuade ourselves to give up. Oh, I found libertarianism very appealing until I realized it meant X, Y, and Z. And I'm so revolted by that that I'm going to switch to determinism or vice versa. And then he says, our only job left is to try to be as honest as we can with ourselves and with each other about what it is that bothers us about the other idea, what it is we find acceptable or desirable about the one we choose. And that's the best we can do. And so we'll just present our example in the world and see what effect that has on other people. So he's, he's consistent in that. He never goes back on it. He really doesn't try to prove and win the day with an argument. Uh, so that's his plan. That's his plan going forward. So let's discuss whether or not we like that before we look at what he does. Is there anything to disagree with or object to in, in that plan? Well, he's sort of forgetting about pursuing truth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he's introduced, you notice he's introduced psychology into the question. He's brought it into the realm of characterological and personal things. So he's not interested in propositional truth or in deductive truth, something that you could know for sure was the case. And you would no, think no, no, but he's not interested he's not interested in truth at all. He's he's interested in in the good life. He's interested in, 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 in being happy. He's, he's, he's changed the subject. Well, he's, he's, okay, so we noticed earlier, and Edwards and Papp said all philosophical questions touch on all the others. They're all sort of intertangled in, in, in an interesting way. Ethics is an appropriate philosophical discussion. So he's brought the question over to ethics. I mean, from the beginning, all of the hard determinists can't wait to get to the end of their argument for determinism, which they barely even put an argument in there to, to point out the fact that we are now free of moral responsibility. So the, the consequences to ethics are right there from the very beginning. And, you know, maybe that's part of what motivates people to be determinists or to be libertarians. They might somebody might say, look, I see so many horrible crimes and I think I'm either going to have to hate humanity from now on, or I can sort of excuse it away as people couldn't do anything but what they're doing. Let's try to make the circumstances better so that it happens less often. Right. So but there's an ethical motivation to the determinists and to the libertarians that's been evident with the determinists from the very beginning there. You know, Paul Ray's whole article was, you know, determinism and 
the illusion of moral responsibility. So he's brought it to the realm of ethics, which is an appropriate philosophical discussion. He's already brought in psychology. So he's talking characterologically and personality wise. He's saying, let's give an example of our character and see how it works on other people. I mean, that's definitely in the mythopoetic characterological realm. It's no longer in the let, he could have said this. He could have said, since we can't settle the question scientifically, let's look at the consequences of each idea and see if those consequences contradict each other. And then we'll know logically that the idea isn't true. But like you point out, he's not interested in finding the propositional truth on the question. He wants to go down the road of ethics and, and sort of discuss it in that realm instead. And he doesn't ever prove that you couldn't disprove either of these either philosophically. He only says scientifically you can't settle it. So I think you're right. He's not even interested anymore. And it, it would seem appropriate to be interested in propositional truth and show that you can't have that either before you go into psychology and character things. But maybe not. I mean, Socrates said ethics is the only subject worth discussing at all. So... See what what you what, what it seems to me what you're doing is is uh, you're showing you're showing how 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 you get you you're showing how difficult the problem becomes when when you don't keep the two languages apart if if one keeps the two languages apart none of these problems come up uh you're 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 when you're living in the world of freedom and responsibility you're not living in the world of determinism and uh and uh, the world that the scientist uh uh <laughs> carves up out for us uh, the, the the two language or uh, two world uh, solution is a wonderful solution, except it it uh, except we live in one world. <laughs> And it would be nice if we had if if we had a unified theory. So, uh, I, yeah, it would be nice. You brought this up yesterday. What, what if I say let's stop calling it the two world theory and let's instead call it the two perspectives theory? I have blue glasses and I have red glasses, and I can only look at the world through either of them. Those are my two languages. The languages don't give me two different worlds. They give me two perspectives for describing the one world. Uh, I don't like that as much as two languages. I'll give you the worlds, but but I'd like to keep the langu two languages. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. Let's call let's call it. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's call it two languages rather than two okay. worlds. Okay. It's yeah. That's world. that's yeah. better. That's better. As a matter of fact. Yeah, it's um, one world, and we can describe it in this language or in this language, and those have problems with each other but those are our tools for approaching it yeah and it's uh, it's what uh, uh, one of those philosophers uh, Dennett I think uh, uh, he talks about um, uh, three three types of explanation there's the there's the uh, uh, there's a physical explanation, and then there's the there's the functional explanation, and then there's the what he calls the intentional explanation, and uh, uh, that works very well. I I kind of like that uh, because we do we do if, if if a person's arm goes up, the physicist can explain it in terms of <laughs> contraction of muscles. Etc. The uh, the uh, the functionalist can can describe it in terms of of uh, the function of muscles and uh, and uh, uh, I'm I'm not sure how he would describe that that 
doesn't lend itself to functionalism. Well, functional could be I raised my arm to grab the glass. No, like, no, that's already intentional. Well, I intend to get a drink. And intentional uh, um, uh, goes okay. way beyond intent and uh, one's intention. It's a term they use for uh, when when you when you give reasons, when you explain when your explanations are in terms of reasons. I I, I uh, the reason my hand went up is because I wanted to give an example, or the reason uh, my hand clasped the the the, the tumbler is because I, I was thirsty and wanted a drink. Uh, <laughs> Now we do have those. We do have those three different languages, uh, and there's a lot. Frankly, I thought the problem had been solved by 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 the language, uh, and actually, actually, it, it goes back to Spinoza, who talked about aspects instead of language. Uh, uh, it's the same. The same thing is happening, but uh, we see it from one aspect, or we see it from another aspect, right. and we've just changed that uh, uh, to <laughs> describing it in terms of lang uh, two different languages. Uh, I, I call them the Spinozian languages. It's it's exactly. And Fichtel pointed out two psychological camps that maps on with it well as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So the two languages, I, I'll stick with you on that. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Keep going. So uh, uh, if, if we accept that, uh, many of the problems that you were bringing up just don't come up. Uh, 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 we don't have to... We, we, the, the, uh, we never have to ask the question, how can we... How can we be free uh, if everything is determined? Uh, you can't talk in terms of determinism, and yes. uh, and it's a, and and uh, both languages are 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 really powerful. Yes, <laughs> but I'd like to throw a little yes. monkey wrench into this uh, by uh, b pointing out that uh, uh, a few centuries ago, scientists were not ready to admit that they make certain assumptions. <laughs> Are they ready now? I don't find them ready now. Then science, then, then they got more sophisticated uh, and, uh, and <laughs> they started listening to philosophers uh, and they uh, uh, started to admit that they do make assumptions just like, uh, just like uh, uh, theology makes assumptions. And the and the reasoning was that uh, we all make assumptions. Uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, religion and theology uh, are based on on one set of assumptions. Science is is based on another set of assumptions, and uh, therefore uh, uh, these uh, uh, the humanity should be respected as much as science. Then uh, then. Um, Quine came along. Yeah. I don't know if it's original with him, uh, but uh, <laughs> Quine. Uh, uh, um, at, at, least, oh, at least he pushed the idea that what, we're, what, what some people were calling the assumptions of science are really uh, are, are really uh, 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 principles principles of investigation that science has accepted tentatively at first, but held on to because of the great progress science made as, uh, with, with these assumptions, with these, uh, with these principles. He doesn't call them assumptions. They're, 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 they're principles of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, I forget the, the whole phrase, but they're, they're, they're principles of investigation, which are, which have proven, which have been proven to be useful 
by the great advances science has made. So, but then he goes further, right? That's fair enough. D doesn't he go further and say the, the, the principles that you'd have to assume to make this effective science possible are true? Because of no, no, he, he, he recognizes that there are, that there are all, that in science there are all, all sorts of, 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 of principles and even statements that aren't true, that, that uh, don't function as, uh, as uh, declarative sentences. He, oh, okay. he 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 uh, uh, he's aware of that. Uh, now my question is, um, since uh, since these th these principles, they're called regulative principles. Yeah, regulative yeah. principles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since these regulative principles have been proven so so effective in 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 science. And and the principle is uh, one of them is the causal closure principle that physical uh, uh, physical events have uh, physical causes. Uh, shouldn't we sort of take these over in our non scientific explanations? You're adding that. That's not quite. Yeah. No. That, that's what I'm that's adding. Okay, I thought that was I thought that was with coin. Okay, so uh, my 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 immediate response is well, obviously not, because okay, so think about the problem that Descartes had with the mind body issue, right? So physical objects, a, a, a pool ball hits a pool ball, they conserve momentum and bounce off of each other at angles. But my mind says raise your arm, and then my arm raises. So then there's this problem. Well, how can something mental cause something physical to happen? Well, if you're a scientist, what you say is, like you said, no, physical things are caused by physical things. Whatever caused your arm to go up was physical. It was your brain. And we have no need to think about the mind at all because there's nothing evident in the physical world that could be a consequence of that thing. So we ban ourselves from consideration of it. Well, that's that's what they should do as scientists. But they're, what makes their science effective is their... Okay, think, think about it this way. Uh, actually, here, here's a good joke. A physicist and a statistician and a biologist are all asked by a team of highly rich, successful people, say, look, we, we want you to go into your lab and come up with a model that would allow us to predict the winner of any horse race. We want to make a lot of money betting on horse races, and we want you to develop the world's first model that would let us predict which of the six horses will cross the finish line first. So they all go away. A couple months later, the statistician comes back and he says, okay, I worked on this. I have a model. It's effective about 20% of the time. And um, it's going to cost you, it's going to cost you a hundred million dollars. It's, but it'll work 20% of the time. So if you're careful with it, you use it or whatever. They say, okay, that's interesting. The biologist comes back and he says, all right. A couple months later, he comes back. He says, all right, we've got a model. It's uh, it's effective 46 percent of the time and it's going to cost you one hundred thousand dollars if you want to use it. They say, wow, that's really great. The physicists come back and they say, look, we've, we, we figured it out. It took us a while. Sorry, it took us so long, but we've got a model. It works 100 percent of the time and it'll cost you one hundred dollars to use. They say, holy cow, really? Share it, share us, share with us the model. They say, okay, consider the horses as spherical balls on a frictionless surface, right? The way they're making progress is they're simplifying the world and not considering things that would make it more complicated, right? I didn't tell the punchline very well, but model the horses as balls on an inclined plane. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> okay. So what scientists are doing in general is they're saying, okay, um, let me not consider anything subjective by definition. To do science, I'm just going to talk about the objective things, the things that I can model as objects. 
and I'm going to co consider it heresy, inappropriate, something we laugh you out. You, know, you can't get a peer-reviewed journal article published, and you shouldn't in a scientific journal, uh, if you're going to talk about anything subjective, because you can't convince me to agree with you based on evidence that you can show. And so that's fine. We're going to limit ourselves a lot. You, you, you're limited in the rules of chess to only doing a few things. So, you know, it's, it's a very limiting thing, the rules of chess. But because it's limited, you can have brilliant chess games. Because the science of la uh, the language of science is limited, they can do very, very powerful things. But then to say, well, because we can do these powerful things by limiting ourselves, why don't you all just assume that there's no such thing as what it's like to see green or what it's like to feel pain? There's no such thing as other minds or even your mind or consciousness or freedom. It's like, no, you've given me no reason not to believe in those things. What you told me was you can't do your work unless you don't consider those things. That's fine. Don't consider them. Do your powerful work. But that doesn't provide you with an argument or evidence that it's not like something to feel pain. That's subjective, but it is like something for me to feel pain. And I imagine it's similar to what it's like for you. And the reason why a poet using a phrase like Mother Earth and greenery means something emotional to us is that it's like something to see green. And you're never going to figure out what, why that's the case by doing science. And you shouldn't be concerned with it. That's not what makes science powerful. But that gives me zero reason to think that I need to take those assumptions and say, well, therefore, I'm living in a black and white world of, of naked objects or something like that. So that's my argument. What do you think? Well, I, 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 I think that, that science someday will be able, will, will, will encompass the, will start dealing with the mental. By subjective, you mean mental, right? Uh, well, so I think that neuroscience will develop really far. So no, I'm not, no, I'm not talking about neuroscience. I'm yeah. talking about... Um, Let, you, let's just you, say... You take, you, take, you take a discipline like psychology. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, I remember when I, uh, uh, when I was in, in, in college... Uh, uh, the the uh, the professor and the textbook spent most of its time uh, trying to convince convince the reader that uh, uh, psychology is a science, uh, uh, and uh, they made some headway when they uh, when they adopted behaviorism, but now they've given up behaviorism overnight. They give up behaviorism, and they're all now talking about. Uh, the mind and and how foolish it was to uh, to reduce it to uh, to the brain. Uh, um, now, uh, <laughs> scientists, uh, psychologists, in their in their in their experiments, uh, I'm talking about clinical psychology now, not not rat, mice and and uh, that sort of thing. They do they use the scientific method? So it seems that they do like asking what it seems that they do come up with hypotheses and then and then and then uh try to try to test them. Uh sure. uh They've, they've tried to find various ways of doing that. I mean, sometimes it's through, uh, I mean, they've got very difficult methods to say, okay, you can't just ask somebody what they think. You have to have this type of a survey. It has to be applied to these types of people. Yeah. They do everything they can to try to scientify it. I think, I think of psychology as sort of the king of the humanities. It kind of, well, it, it sort of has one foot in both worlds. Is, is yeah. And, it. and it, 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 uh, it values testimony. Right. But it, it tries to make that testimony more valuable with all these restrictors, which it has to do because testimony yeah, yeah. 
It's all it's 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 both in that characterological personality mesh, and also they're trying to pin it down and make it. So the people who try to pin it down the most are like the behavioralist, though. Is that you're not going to reduce it to something like that? It's sort of stuck with one foot in the quicksand of the personal and one foot on the hardness of science. And I don't think it's ever going to just be for the same reason that you pointed out, like the, the behavioralist tried to pin it down to something like with a solid foundation, you can't do it really, really quickly. Um, just for twilight and path. I don't know if we've shared this before. So, uh, behavioralists, um, I'm sure you're familiar with what they are, but so behavioralists tried to say, look, enough with this anti-scientific, this extra, almost prophetic and mysterious and, and poetic, all of this. We are going to study the behaviors of people and things like and animals, and we're going to study it in a scientifically respectable way. So let's start defining things. Well, we want to study pain. OK, what is pain? Well, certain psychologists might say, show me eight different pictures of a face grimacing to smiling and tell me, report how bad your pain is and where you are on this chart. And then we'll take the reports of 10,000 people and we'll compare it with what it is we think they're actually going through. And of course, it's subjective and it's very complicated, but they tried their best to scientify it that way. But the behavioralists said this. They said, OK, look, it. here's what pain is. Pain is something that is nothing more than everything that I can describe physically and measure physically. So when you're in pain, what that means is that you're grabbing your toe and you're going, ow, 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 right? It's your behaviors that we mean by pain. That's not hinting to me that you're in pain. That's what being in pain actually is. And then they would go a little further sometimes and say, if you're in an EKG machine and we see certain parts of your brain light up and they always light up every time that you're in pain, we'll call that one of the behaviors that you're doing. But as sophisticated as it got, they tried to basically say, there's no meaningful, there's no meaningful talk about anything unless it's measurable. And so we're going to talk about these seemingly subjective things by defining them in ways that we can measure. So, it's a, it's a brilliant and sophisticated and very interesting group of thinkers. They're, they're really interesting. Um, so I'm sorry to, to introduce them and make a joke out of them. Uh, Skinner, I think, is the one I'm thinking of. Uh, B.F. Skinner, he was a behavioralist, and I think he's the one I'm thinking of. But in any case, there's this old joke, this very interesting joke. It's got a philosophical punch to it. Uh, Skinner is in bed with his wife, and he turns and he looks at her and he says... <clears throat> That was good for you. Was it good for me? Because in the behavioralist perspective, she has privileged access to the physical signs of data that he had a good time. And he can tell if she had a good time. But neither of them are speaking meaningfully when they say self-report. You know, there's no internal quality to their experience of, of any kind. Um so anyway, that's that's probably enough of a general introduction to both the criticism. and. But like you said, doctor, they tried to pin it down like that. But I think there's good reasons for people to be dissatisfied that that's all of the meaningful talk you can have about subjective things. What gets me is that is that for 30 or 40 years, that was that was orthodoxy uh, and and in in psychology and everyone jumped on the bandwagon and then all of a sudden they jumped off the bandwagon what, this, what what's that say for uh, for the discipline well it says i think what i've been trying to say which is that this penis envy for science is a mistake um by the way we're, we're not trying to just shit on the behavioralists they came up with a lot of interesting things and they're well worth studying even if we don't think that they're assumption is correct or if we're if i'm trying to shit on it in a way but um oh shoot my computer went to sleep hold on are you still there did i lose you so <clears throat> what you're talking about though doctor is these fads these these intellectual yeah. fads and i i think the thing to do is to recognize that we're forever in a tug of war between two incompatibles and whatever the trend is at the time you should understand that the trend in the other direction is coming and, and we're trying to find balance. So I don't know. That's just, that's just my own psychological sort of 
approach to it. It's not necessary. How much of that do you think might be attributable to uh, social pressure and uh, people yeah. acting psychologically, uh, you know, predisposed, not predisposed, but uh, a manner, yeah? No, I think that's why we use the word fad. I think you're correct. I think I have a question, if I might. Please, please. Yeah, so, so far we have uh, red determinants of various sorts and then, uh, and then uh, what, pragmatists and, and this, but, but, but I don't remember a, a true uh, libertarian philosopher that we've covered so far in this class. And I'm new to philosophy, doctor. And, and doctor, thank you for being here. I appreciate your time very much. Very interesting to listen to. Uh, what would you guys say the most foremost uh, libertarian philosopher uh, so I think is. I agree with you. We, we, William James is a libertarian. At the end of his paper, he says, "I believe in free will, and here's why." Um, the the other ones, they're all sort of compatibilists of one sort. At least the ones that we've looked at so far. Really, I think so. I think I agree with you. Like uh, Lewis, I, mean, I, I thought that he was kind of a pragmatist. So I guess I I, I misunderstood uh, William James completely. It sounds like. So, so we'll finish talking about William James before we wrap this up and close it out. But William James, his entire paper, he is a pragmatist because, you know, um, hold on a second. We should have said this earlier. Um, uh, Dr. Tartaglia brought up Pierce and Pierce and William James are sort of the founders of an American school of thought called pragmatism. But pragmatism isn't their answer. It's not their position on determinism versus free will. It's their entire philosophical approach to all philosophical questions. And William James utilizes that approach to uh, eventually conclude that he's a libertarian and to give us the reasons why. Um, so it's a very dissatisfying kind of libertarianism. What we, what we haven't found, and what I think you're pointing out here, is we don't have the counterpart to Paul Ray. Paul Ray is like, I'm standing in the boxing ring. I've got the gloves on. I'm going to prove determinism. I welcome all comers. Bring it on. Boom, boom, boom. Every libertarian is sort of like, well, you know, I'm kind of in the middle. And the determinism, certainly that's a very important principle of thinking. And, you know, there's... there's there, there, if I may interrupt, there are some, there are some uh, uh, libertarians who, who, who just say, if there's one thing I'm sure of is that I'm a, I'm a, sometimes I'm a free and responsible individual and, 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 and I'm just sure of that. And when I think about determinism, I don't quite understand it. It's, uh, there's, 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 uh, People have 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 attacked it. There's there's quantum theory. There's probabilities involved. All of that I don't understand. So I certainly am not going to embrace that. I'm a libertarian. Yes, that's so, a, that's true. The, the, all I meant to say is the excerpts we've read so far in the course, we haven't had an example of that yet. Yeah, but yet, yeah, but yeah. And w what's great about those libertarians is that. Like we said in the intro to this whole subject, the determinists have a formula that in the formula is if the world is deterministic, then there's no such thing as free will. And the type of libertarian Tartaglia is mentioning right now is say, yes, of course, that's true. Of course, that's true. If the world is deterministic, there's no such thing as free will. And the determinists say, well, the world is deterministic. Therefore, there's no such thing as free will. And these libertarians say, well, I know there's free will. So therefore, the world's not deterministic. I don't. That's my argument that the world is not deterministic, is that I've got the free will. And and you rightly point out and you're completely correct that there are definitely those guys in the boxing ring on both extremes here who say this is an easy question. It's this formula works and I affirm the antecedent or I deny the consequent. Um, we just haven't yet. I, I haven't felt like we've read anybody who satisfies my desire to read the counterpoint to Paul Ray. I put a few suggested readings in the intro section on the website of other people we might read. And I think one or two of them might count as that. But now what about, so, what yeah, about, I'd like to hear something that's totally juxtaposed uh, to Ray, to be honest. Just uh, 
let's hear the argument, but I, but I haven't heard that. Uh, I haven't heard that yet. Agreed. Doctor? Well, uh, give me uh, Ray's uh, argument, would you? Yeah, it's sort of, <clears throat> I, I want to do it justice and be fair to it, but I don't think he really argues for determinism. It, it does seem like William James is correct in identifying that this is a faith position for the hard determinists and the absolute libertarians or the hard libertarians, if we want to call them that. Because in his entire essay, he does a very admirable job of being consistently deterministic in the way he looks at things. But he doesn't really give us an argument to accept determinism. What he says is... Um, he just keeps asserting it like a matter of faith. If we knew all of the factors that go into making up a person's inclinations and we knew everything that ever happened to them and we knew all of the details surrounding their current situation, we would be able to accurately predict what they were about to choose. Now, he says it and he believes it. and He's very consistent and quite intelligent about it. I don't think I remember him making a good argument to accept it. Path, the twi Twilight or Path, do I remember him making more of an argument for why we should accept determinism, or does he just sort of say, I accept it, that's the way to think, and then let's move forward? Well, the, you're right, he doesn't, uh, arguments aren't given, uh, the, the as you, you put it very well, uh, if we know everything about a per uh, the history of a person, everything that went into his his upbringing, and we knew all the details and all the forces acting on him. Uh, uh, it's not so much of an argument as 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 saying uh, it's self evident that he wouldn't be free. Don't you? we? We all agree, don't we, that if we had all of that information, we would agree that he's not a free agent. Well, we would agree that we could predict accurately what he was about to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think you're right. He's basically daring us to disagree with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that could be a pretty strong argument. And we could consider that his his argument for why we should accept it. It's like, I don't have to do more than assert it. How could you disagree with this? If you knew all these factors, yeah. do you really think you wouldn't know what he was about to do? And but the problem is that the libertarians on the other side, they say, yeah, actually, I wouldn't know. Because sometimes I'm in a position where everything about my inclinations and my character would tell me to do X, but I feel like it's my moral responsibility to not do X. And so I make a moral effort and I have an absolute choice and I, or, or they make other arguments, but they just say, yeah, there are moments where the person has to act before the universe knows where to go. Um, and both of those do sound like faith positions to me. I think William James got that part correct. Uh, <clears throat> that that Paul Ray and this type of libertarian we're talking about, they're really asserting what they, the way they see the world, how they want to see the world. I don't really know. I don't think Paul Ray gave us more of an argument than just to say, this is how I think. And, you know, a libertarian could come along and say, well, you gave me no evidence or argument why I should. So I think the opposite. I deny what you're saying. Um, well, when uh, it occurred to me, to me when you uh, articulated the determinist, the hard de the, uh, determinism just now, that uh, it, it uh, it's tautological. Uh, 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 <clears throat> being, uh, if you knew, if you knew in in, in the. Yeah. All the forces acting on, on on a person, and you and you know it uh, uh, in every every detail. Uh, uh, you would be able to predict what he would do. Uh, <laughs> that's Absolutely. part of the meaning of cause, right? It, yeah. It, it, it seems to me that 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 that's yeah. I don't. <laughs> no, it's interesting. It's really interesting. I, it, you reminded me. I, we've never talked about jokes before, but here's a third joke in our class for the first time. 
there's, there was a really interesting scientific study or uh, an experiment that was done where they put people in some sort of CAT scan or EKG or something. They were looking at their mind and they were processing the data of their brain. And then they asked them to play rock, paper, scissors with an opponent. And I think after analyzing the data, I don't think they did it in real time, but let's say they did it in real time. They were able to know if you were going to pick rock, paper, or scissors, like a full tenth of a second before you knew what you were going to pick. Like they were looking at the part of your brain that was really making the decision, the part that you weren't conscious of, and they were able to identify what you were going to do before you even knew what you were going to do. And so they could make a machine that could beat you at rock, paper, scissors all the time. And when this came out, this is sort of what the determinists have always been claiming. Well, if we knew everything going on, you would realize that you're you're making up a story about why you're choosing what you're choosing. But really, you don't have access to the things that are really making you do what you do and, and that sort of thing. And um, so a, a lot of determinists really celebrated this experiment. There was there was a, a, a counter position given by a philosopher who said, you're free unless you're playing rock, paper, scissors against this scientist while you're in his EKG machine, <laughs> which, which I think is illustrating sort, sort of the tautological point about this, which is um, when the determinist says, if I knew all the factors that go into the universe, I could, I could predict what you're going to do at any time. It's sort of like saying, if I was God, I would know everything. Great. You're never going to be God. And here we are not being God. Let's just keep living in the world that we actually live in, which is the world where it, it's reasonable to talk about what someone might do. That, that, that language isn't, isn't meaningless just because if you knew everything, you, you, would, you would know what was going to happen. Now, I mean, that's not my position or anything. It just shows that the, the debate is alive. Like, I don't think that experiment proved quite what the determinists wish it did, but I also don't think the joke gets rid of the problem of determinism. So I'm not trying to make an argument with that, but just to say that they're, they're, both sides are still unconvinced by what the other side is trying. Is I, trying. I, uh, uh, Stephen, I never realized you were, you, you were so uh, uh, much opposed to uh, uh, middle ground uh, uh, on, on this issue. Uh, oh, yeah. you, 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 you have no, uh, uh, you, you don't think that uh, compatibilism uh, says anything worthwhile? Well, I, I don't think I'm talking about my position. So <clears throat> when we finish this section, I've actually added an extra lecture where we're just going to talk about Daniel Dennett. I mean, I've read all of his works. I think he's really brilliant. That's not my position either, by the way. I don't, I'm not a compatibilist in Daniel Dennett's camp but I think he's absolutely brilliant. And one of the things that makes him so brilliant is that we've looked at some compatibilists who say, well, maybe there's a language problem here. Maybe this is a pseudo problem. Maybe I can have my cake and eat it too. Daniel Dennett kind of agrees with some of that in some of his books, but he goes a lot further and he says, wait a minute. So let's just, let's just say the compatibilist position is this. The world could be completely deterministic and at the same time, I could have free will. And of course, all the hard determinists had explode and all of the hard libertarians had explodes and everybody's head explodes because he's denying that first premise. If determinism, then no free will. But that's what the compatibilists do in one way or another. And some of them do it psychologically. Some of them do it with a language issue and, and, and all of that. What Daniel Dennett does is quite interesting. He says, OK, yeah, maybe we're confused and what we're talking about, but I still have a burden on me to demonstrate how it could be that in a deterministic evolutionary world, creatures actually could evolve that have a capacity to direct their own lives. And so he, he, he if you're interested in that, again, I'm still not talking about my position on this issue, but if you're interested in that, I think it's really interesting. He wrote, he wrote a number of books of, on different levels about this, but one of them that's really great is called Freedom Evolves, which is sort of his popular philosophy book. And 
you'll be introduced to him in the way he thinks. And also he's an excellent explainer of ideas. He can take the most complicated ideas and explain them really, really well. So I like him and I like the compatibilist, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why you say I'm being, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep the debate clear between the hard libertarians and the hard determinists. I'm not really expressing my position though. Well, uh, what makes, what makes take, you say? take the, uh, what's your reaction to, uh, to, uh, uh, the soft determinists saying, uh, if we if if we meant by free freedom if we meant by a free agent if we meant by freedom uncaused then of course determinism and freedom are incompatible but we don't mean uncaused by freedom by a free agent a free agent a free agent is someone who acts from causes within him, within his personality and character. Mm -hmm. And that's compatible with determinism. Now, there was a time, there was a time when I accepted that reluctantly, but, uh, 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 in other words, w w what he's saying is uh, the the whole philosophical problem is really a linguistic problem. We're we're confused. We're <laughs> we're confused uh, uh, about the meaning of the the word freedom here. I really like their position, and I don't think it goes quite far enough. But I really like it. So. That's all, that's another way of Daniel Dennett's also in that camp, right? He's 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 nice. saying exactly what you just said. He's saying um, creatures that can be self-directing to some degree are rightly said to have freedom, and you know rocks don't have freedom, clams don't have freedom, a fish that's got a simple neurological trigger mechanism might not have any freedom, but he's kind of got more freedom than a rock, and all we need is to evolve to a point where some part of the forces that go into our decision making are rightly said to belong to us for us to be free. There's two things to say about it. One is the hard determinists have, and maybe this helps illustrate that they're just in a tautology, but they have a, a, a worrying response to that that seems pretty powerful, which is when I said everything that goes into your decision making makes you what you are i meant that's forming your sense of more of morality that's forming your willpower what you think is willpower all of those things are just as caused as any other part of you so even if they are two links in the chain of you making a decision and one of them is uh causing the other one and it's and they're both internal to you even the first one was caused by things outside yourself. You've got your sense of what's morally right and your sense that you should have willpower. All of that comes from your natural proclivities and the things that have happened to you. And so you still haven't overturned anything I said. The compatibilists are really interesting because they see the problem, or at least the Daniel Dennett types, they see that problem clearly. And yet they think they can argue to, to demonstrate why we have what Den Dennett calls second tier volitions where he says okay i want to eat the chocolate bar and so i'm going to but i want to not want eat to eat the chocolate bar so maybe i'm going to find some new friends who go to the gym a lot so i feel shitty about myself so that i'll eventually be determined not to eat chocolate bars so much and, you know so he talks about second tier volitions and other things like that to try to find freedom that can emerge out of a deterministic system I think the reason why the reason why that doesn't settle the question in the libertarian side of things where we actually have freedom the way I think it can be settled is because it doesn't take it doesn't take the characterological element seriously enough. It tries to reduce it to just another another thing that could be understood scientifically and causally, which the determinists can always respond with, yeah, that too. That's also caused in, in an unbroken chain of causality. 
and so that's but what, what 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 what's good about uh, the uh, compatibilist is that when the when the when the uh, hard determinist says and that too is caused the 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 uh, compatibilist comes back sure. and, and, and says <laughs> i agree with you that too is caused but that's not the point yeah the the yeah. The, the the soft determinist here's a, uh, an example the soft determinist is standing before a judge and uh and uh uh, uh the, the, the the judge says um uh, it concerns a, a crime involving uh, getting into a car uh, uh did you get into the car freely and uh, uh, uh the, the the guy answers uh well, uh, you know, uh, determinism, it was all determined. My, uh, the behavior of my body was all determined eons ago. No, I, 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 I did not get into the car. Uh, I was not a free agent in getting into the car, and therefore I, uh, no crime was committed. And what, what, what the judge, as a practical man, would say, <laughs> would say, listen, were you pushed into the car? Were you shoved into the car? Were you carried into the car? Or did you, or did you, did your legs bring you into the car? Yeah. Uh, 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 or uh, he, he might even say, was there a gun pointing at you and uh, uh, forcing you to get into the car? Uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the defendant would have to say, uh, well, no, uh, none of those. And and the judge would say, then you freely got into the car. Yeah. And, yeah well, you willed to get into the car. Right. You willed. You, it, was I, your, it was your I choice. Don't like, I myself don't like will talk. Okay. Uh, uh, I think it blurs the... Uh, uh, even even calling it the problem of free will, it's not freedom of the will. It's freedom of the individual. Okay. It's freedom of the. In, I, I don't like when the will is brought in there. Uh, uh, I think it just blurs the situation. But is is the is the <laughs> compatibilist correct in saying when we. No, normally, when we call an agent a free agent, all that we mean is he wasn't constrained. Well, that's all the judge cares about, right? And and so I think what you're pointing out is that the judge is saying, I'm not here to determine, I'm not here to settle the determinism question. That has no legal significance. Right. I don't care if the Big Bang forced you to get into the car because everything happened and had to happen the way it happened. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in, did you choose to get in the car? Did you get into the car without coercion? I guess is the language we should yeah. use the way you set it up. We're, did you get into the car without being coerced? That's the only thing that matters to me to settle questions of legal responsibility and uh, and, I, and I'm saying that in everyday life, that's what we mean too. Yes, that's what the compatibilists. Yeah, that's that's what they like to point out is that. So Daniel Dennett says it this way: He says all of the meaningful notions of responsibility that really matter to us that we don't want to lose when the determinist tells us we're not free. We get we get to have all of those. None of those are affected by the by the world being deterministic. Because all we mean is that no one was pointing a gun at your head and made you do it. Yeah, and exactly. You know, um, let's let's talk about that more in the after show. So I'm going to end the recording, and that's where we'll.